Today, we will be discussing the cybersecurity crisis, specifically in K through 12 schools and the current state of cybersecurity in those schools. We're also gonna talk about cybersecurity best practices to give you more insight on what you and your school can do to prevent cyber attacks. Hopefully by the end of today, of our time today, we, will, we hope you feel more comfortable and confident about cybersecurity awareness and how it affects your school, faculty, and students. At Xtel, we are passionate about cybersecurity and providing our customers with the best network management possible. And our goal today is to share insights on top recommendations to immediately improve cybersecurity, cybersecurity specific to your needs and challenges. Today, our guests include Ray Sloff, Xtel's Senior Solutions Engineer, Stephen Talent, Chief Revenue Officer at Highwire Networks, and Craig Salmon, Sandman, co-founder of Symbol Security. You can expect each speaker to have the floor for about 10 minutes, followed by a Q&A at the end of uh, all of our sessions. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into your chat window and we'll address them during the Q&A portion. We're gonna start with Ray, who will give you some insights into Xtel's network security and cybersecurity offerings. He will then hand it off to Steve from Highwire and then Craig from Symbol Securities. Both Highwire and Symbol were handpicked because of their excellence in their respective cybersecurity offerings, and Excel is proud to have them as technology partners. That being said, Ray, the floor is yours. Great, thanks, Brian. Hello, everybody. Uh, just wanted to take a quick minute to review how Xtel is helping protect your network from cybersecurity threats. You may know Xtel as an HPBX or cloud phone system provider or an ISP providing your internet services. Uh, Xtel has been securing and managing the edge with our DDoS denial of service product and our managed firewall products um, throughout the years. Through our product evolution and the cybersecurity landscape, we have added a few more critical products to strengthen your cybersecurity program. Sentinel-1, our endpoint detection and response, EDR, endpoint detection and response, is the buzzword that folks are using today for antivirus. So we've chosen uh, Highwire, secure, Highwire Networks to provide uh, Sentinel-1 endpoint detection and response fully managed. Steven will touch on this in a few minutes. In addition to the EDR, we can also ingest any security event log from any managed services or security platform within your network. If you have Office 365, the security center, if you have a, a Fortinet firewall, we can ingest the firewall logs. Um, that in conjunction with the Sentinel-1 managed products allows you to have a single pane of glass with 24-7, 365 eyes on your security event logs and security events that may be happening on your network. Um, this leads to some playbook automation and Xtel's white glove support where we'll reach out to you and contact your organization support team if we're seeing anomalous behavior on your network. In addition to the EDR, we've also added another product over the past year to address your biggest asset and liability, your end user. Cybersecurity awareness training is critical to your cybersecurity program. Training your end users on what to do and what not to do is the platform that Craig from Symbol will be speaking about in a few minutes. As the bad actor vectors are getting more and more sophisticated, it's important for you to educate your end users on how they can help protect your network and data. Craig, in just a few minutes, is gonna share his experiences. Thanks, Brian, I can throw it back to you. All right, thanks, Ray, that was great. Uh, well, next up is Steve from Highwire. Floor is yours, Steve. Excellent. Right on. So, uh, so glad to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the threat landscape uh, and, and that uh, the, the threat condition facing the K through 12 environment. 
uh, and talk a little bit about how, um, you know, how that has evolved uh, and, and the security measures and the countermeasures that many organizations are, are needing to look at today. So, you know, just to start with the whole Lions of Tigers and Bears aspect of this, uh, the fact of the matter is that the, the, K2, the K through 12 environment is really a targeted uh, environment for, for bad actors and is dealing with a variety of different uh, vulnerabilities uh, just as an organization uh, as a whole. But what we're finding is, you know, basically what over, over the last two decades, tw uh, 32 million uh, records have have been have been breached 2700 different uh, uh, security breaches in 2023 11 separate breaches alone occurred and six of those were ransomware uh, so ransomware hit 89 different K through 12 organizations in the US educational sector last year including 44 universities colleges 45 school districts and literally what you're dealing with is you're dealing with a concerted effort uh, to engage what we would call a soft target, if you will, um, that, that sort of, you know, uh, is, is, is the reason that we see this exacerbation and this increased effort uh, uh, to, uh, to basically break into uh, the K through 12 environment. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about a couple of the, the high profile breaches that have occurred out there. Cause I think we, you know, we may have seen these in the news, but, but it's good to understand a little bit about the different breaches and what occurred. Uh, in this particular scenario, the Des Moines uh, public schools, you know, basically on, on January 19th of 2023, the IT staff at Iowa's biggest school district uh, took, you know, basically took 71 buildings offline, including 63 schools and virtual secondary schools. And they took them offline due to a ransomware impact. Right. So for the next two days, about 30,000 students were out of school as the staff basically worked to restore uh, the servers, the Internet, the networks and the websites. Uh, students eventually returned to, to school without Internet uh, on January 12th. Uh, and Wi-Fi wasn't even restored until the 27th. So, so what happened here is, you know, you're dealing with a ransomware attack that created an, a, an operational crisis for the, for the school district. Uh, sorry for the background noise there. Um, so, so what happened there, basically ransomware, uh, as we all know, we probably all have a good feel for what ransomware does. It's not like, you know, 10 years ago when you had to have an explanation of what a, a security breach did. Ransomware is pretty clear cut. It locks up your stuff until you pay the ransom. The challenge that we're seeing with ransomware attacks today is it's not just the ransomware that locks up the systems. It's also the threat of, of double extortion, if you will. So pay the ransomware or we're going to post all the kids' information to the internet, which could include a variety of, of different uh, of, of pieces of information that are, that are obviously we don't want on the, on the street or on the dark web to include, uh, you know, their, their ethnic backgrounds, uh, their financial uh, situation, whether they've been, you know, uh, demoted or promoted from, from moving into classes, their psychological challenges that may have been a part of data stored in, in the environment there. So in this situation, that's what happened with the Des Moines Public Schools. And what they did was they, they spent a period of time trying to understand how they could get out of this situation. And, and the bad actors have put a lot of thought into these, unfortunate, these situations, unfortunately, and make it very tough uh, to recover without complying. Uh, the challenge, though, with the ransomware uh, situation is that 80 percent of organizations that suffer a ransomware attack are hit again. Uh, and so, the, you know, paying the ransom doesn't take you off the hook of getting uh, breached uh, uh, again. It actually uh, increases the likelihood that you'll be targeted because you've been proven to pay, basically. Next slide, please. So another one that I think is interesting as well from, from a breach perspective was, was a little bit different than ransomware. And this is a supply chain breach. So Illuminate is a, is a software uh, technology used by schools for a variety of different aspects of school administration. Um, what they're doing is they're storing information about the students and, and they provide different software programs for the administrative aspect of running schools, basically. And, and literally what happened in this scenario was uh, Illuminate, the software company, it's a, you know, a $150 million a year software company focused at education. You know, a breach occurred where the, where the attacker accessed the Illuminate uh, education system. Uh, and, and it was, you know, basically uh, accessed all of the data that was stored in that system. And this is what we call a supply chain attack, where software being used in the environment to conduct the business operations of, of running a school uh, was the vulnerability. And while the school was expecting that the software was going to function the way that it did, a 
malicious actors actually got into that system and then were therefore able to access the data uh, for the students and for the administrators. So this was a different, a little bit different style of attack, but what you see in these two different types of attacks is the level of sophistication of the attacker and the existential crisis that it creates for the operations of, of the school environment. So what this is doing is this is precipitating a new look at cybersecurity in the K through 12 environments with an understanding of some of the limiting factors that K through 12 is dealing with. Number one, budget. Number two, cybersecurity skills gap, right? Negative unemployment in the cybersecurity space uh, and, and that creates a real challenge uh, for organizations. So next slide, please. So if you're curious and you want to, you know, you really want to go down the rabbit hole of what's happening uh, out there in the K-12 environment, you can check out k126.org uh, forward slash map. You see the URL there. What this does is actually breaks out the breaches, exactly what happened in those environments, and you can look at them by the type of breach. What's interesting to note, and I don't know what's going on in South Dakota, but South Dakota is the only state in the union that actually hasn't suffered a substantial breach or reported it. What is going to be changing is new regulations are going to be coming down the pike, which indicate that, that the K through 12 environments need to publicly notify uh, in, in the event of a security breach. Now, this has not been the case for K through 12 in the past, but it has been the case for businesses in many states in the union where if you suffer a security breach, you need to publicly notify uh, that you have suffered a breach. Now, obviously, this is a real problem from, from, a, from a PR perspective where businesses are looking this, at, at this as a real risk risk to their ability to uh, retain customers uh, for, for, for a variety of different reasons. 40% of the cost of a security breach for a business is lost business. And that's, you know, a lot of that has to do with the reputational impact. But here you can see kind of what's going on around the nation, what areas are being hit. You can kind of drill into to where you're at and see, you know, who's been affected near you. Uh, but it gives you a perspective of the breadth of the challenge facing K, the K through 12 environment. Uh, and, it, and it really is a tough spot, right? As mentioned, you've got a cybersecurity skills gap that you're dealing with. Uh, and then you've got budgetary impact. You don't have money growing on trees in the K-12 environment. So what do you do to reduce the risk that you face as a K-12 organization? Next slide, please. Now, you can't overnight just magically, you know, sort of, you know, evolve into this this optimally secured environment just because that's not reality. The reality is that it's a process. It, it really is a process that starts from where you're at today. Um, now, depending on where you're at today, you could be in a pretty good state. Uh, you may be in, in a, at, a, at a less risky position, uh, but chances are you're probably in that 1.0 range. And what K-12-6 does here with this particular framework is speak to the different four basically steps of, of reducing risk for the for your environment and what you can do in a stepped process that allows you to get started with some of the the, the fundamental aspects that are going to reduce some risk and move to a continuous improvement model of improving your capabilities one of the things that i think is going to be important for, for uh, as a takeaway from this is that none of these measures that you see here are going to be capital intensive everything that you're you're you're, you're going to see in, in this in this stepped process comes to you as an operational expense or as a monthly fee thanks to the way extel is breaking down the technologies and adding the the people process and technology into a service offering uh, that comes to you as a monthly recurring fee as opposed to a capital expense so you're not going to have to come out of pocket with a bunch of cash to do this. For one, what you'll see in the K-12-6 essentials is, is sanitize the network. That's step number one. And I'm sure we all have firewalls out there today. If you don't, a next-gen firewall, or you have an older firewall, even a firewall that's five years old is, is, is dated from the perspective of the way attackers are, are attacking networks today. But step one is really sanitizing that network. It's a next generation firewall. Uh, you know, Xtel can provide you that that functionality uh, as a as a monthly recurring fee, as opposed to that capital expense. Segmenting the network. One of the things that we see across the board, any of these breaches that you see, if you go and check out that map and you drill into any of the breaches you see in there, the lack of segmentation in the network caused the 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 bad actor to propagate entirely inside that environment and hold ransom more and more of the machines in the network as a result of a flat network. And what a flat network Network means is if I land in one building, I can see the other building basically just by connecting to Wi-Fi and I can basically 
go look at the you know the lab over there and and, and basically move laterally within the organization without any risk. Segmentation really reduces that the risk of, of of something that could be affecting a student's machine, then propagating through the rest of the school. Email security is the other critical one, right? Ninety percent of of the breaches uh, of malware is landing in email accounts. Phishing is getting better and better. You know, it used to be kind of funny, like the grammar was bad and et cetera. You could kind of go, okay, this guy's obviously, you know, English, English is second language and you could kind of see it. But now the phishing attempts coming through are really, really convincing. Uh, and there's, there's quite a bit of research that's been done around uh, those, those uh, types of, of scenarios so that when they come in there, they, they look legit. Uh, and then, uh, you know, basically step two is start to safeguard those devices. That's where you're adding the detection and response functionality that Ray mentioned earlier, which, you know, Sentinel-1 Complete is fantastic. You'll see a lot of the, the K-12 through environment leveraging Sentinel-1 Complete to reduce the risk of ransomware on endpoints. But that's key, right? Safeguarding those devices. Uh, protecting the identities. You start to get into another step up of reducing risk in the 3.0 phase here where you add in multi-factor authentication, a password manager and you start to look at a zero trust concept which is an expansion on the micro segmentation or the segmentation of the network and starts to look at least privilege access like people should not be accessing the the the, the accounting servers if they're a student and the like right that concept and then you move over into continuous improvement where you're adding a functionality around extended detection and response, right? And what that does is basically take the native capabilities of the technology, of the software, the endpoint detection and response software and extend that across the environment. So what that means is that something bad happens on the firewall. Somebody's trying to stand up a tunnel. They shouldn't be doing it. Um, the detection and response functions will cross over into the firewalls or into the collaboration speed, uh, suite, taking actions to close risk and, and shut down open gaps or open holes in the network or different exploits that might be uh, being utilized there. So the reason that, that, that I think this makes sense is because it's a stepped process in improving your security uh, you know, resiliency as well as reducing risk in the environment because what you're facing is you've got school teachers and admins. That's one attack vector, right? You've got your tech savvy students. I heard the recent, uh, recent uh, uh, study that we saw, um, basically a student was attacking China. And so he kind of created, you know, an interest from China in that particular school. And as a result, they denial of service the entire school and you took down one of the largest school districts in the nation. And it was basically a plucky tech savvy student sort of poking the bear, if you will, and, and getting the bear to poke back. So you've got the students out there that create risk. You've got the school suppliers as we saw with, uh, with the Illuminate breach where you're, you're using technologies in there and those technologies may not be properly secured. They may be used uh, to, uh, by nefarious actors that look legitimate, but they start to, ha to have behaviors that would indicate something bad is happening. And and then you've got the online criminals. The online criminals kind of come in two blends. For one, there's the soft target attackers, right? They're targets of opportunity. They basically would see K-12 environments as a big attack surface that's not properly defended or not fully defended. So they see that as a soft target and they go after that. And then you've got the more nefarious ones, which are sophisticated K through 12 oriented attackers where they spend a lot of time understanding the business operations of K-12, the seasonality, how the, the different administrators, their privileges and their, their, their traditional access levels and whatnot, and it will specifically target those types of operators. So th that's where you build this sort of life cycle of, of risk and try to reduce risk as you go through this. Next slide, please. And how you, how you can look at that in another way is security services and inserting security services into the different tiers of risk reduction. Uh, so what you'll see here is, is MXDR is a big one. Um, that one is, is it, I wouldn't call it a catch-all, but it does a lot to secure a lot of the environment because XDR is taking account into uh, ingesting uh, all of the stuff that's coming in, understanding the data that's in play, looking for uh, across that data for behaviors that would indicate malicious actors uh, and taking action as a result in an automated capacity at machine speed. So I think that's important. But, but rest assured, you, you have access to a variety of different Different services to secure different areas of your environment uh, based on this. Next slide, please. 
I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but just to speak about how you have access to a hardware inclusive service that, that allows you to update your, your firewalls to best in breed, best in class security capability that available today, right? So many of y'all are probably leveraging firewalls that have been there for a while. You, you look at that and the capital expense associated to, to upgrading those devices and you may, may have deferred uh, based on that, that capital expense. The, the wonderful thing about your Extel relationship here is that you can access a monthly recurring fee type firewall that's fully managed, includes the hardware, and it comes to you in a, in a consumable capacity uh, that allows you to also upgrade that firewall at a later date without having to own and depreciate the asset, which is a nice uh, function. Next slide, please. That was the segmenting the network and the, the sanitizing the network aspect uh, of, of what we, we uh, addressed earlier. Next slide, please. Um, the endpoint detection and response is critical, right? We, you know, the, we talked about safeguarding devices, and that's where EDR uh, t steps in or managed detection and response steps in. Again, this is taking the Sentinel One complete technology and providing it a managed uh, capacity that comes to you as a monthly fee as opposed to a capital expense or a front loaded expense critically important to sanitizing those devices. It should be running on the endpoints. It should be running on the servers uh, of your administrators. Uh, obviously, you may not be able to get this pushed down to the students. The students need to do something too, but you may not have control of their devices there, but you can secure uh, your own uh, uh, you know, entities in inside your network and those that are mobile employees uh, of, of the school districts with, with a managed detection and response solution that sanitizes and safeguards those devices. Next slide, please. And then the Mac Daddy is MXDR, right? So MXDR really is risk on a screen and the ability to respond, detect and respond at machine speeds to everything in the attack surface. That's critically important here because what's happening is, you know, if they'll check the, the, the knobs and the, and, the, and the windows and everything. And basically you've got bad actors that are looking for ways in and they're looking for vulnerabilities and just defending the endpoints. While that's an important component, you need to be looking at everything and responding uh, across the firewalls, the collaboration suites, the cloud implementations, any of the breaches that you saw there can be mitigated by MXDR because MXDR takes a holistic look at the security environment and can detect and respond across it all. So there's a ton of, of capability in this. And what you're going to see is MXDR is going to become one of the most broadly adopted security services uh, in the space, not just in K-12, K through 12, but across business and everywhere else because of the security efficacy of this approach. Next slide, please. And wrapping here, yes, I do drink a lot of coffee. I apologize for the staccato speed of my delivery, but really exciting subject. I, 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 I dig what I do here from this perspective. Uh, hit it again, if you would. Uh, I did put some animations in there. I think the key things to, to take away from this is that the, the, the know-how around this space uh, that, that, uh, that we have in that K-12 K environment, the specialization of cybersecurity capabilities within the school environment is a differentiator. We mentioned the fact that the, the, the operators are a challenge. Cybersecurity skills gap, 0% unemployment rate, negative unemployment rate in cybersecurity operators. We bring those security operators to bear and allow you to consume that in an economies of scale perspective where you're basically able to access the cybersecurity experts without having to pay their egregious uh, annual salaries. Um, customized for your school environment and using advanced security capabilities to lock down uh, your environment at, while allowing it to function in the way uh, that you would want it to from, a, from, a, from a, an operational perspective. Uh, and then again, consuming it as a monthly recurring fee, consuming it as an operational expense. Everything that you saw here from the countermeasures perspective comes to you as a monthly fee and not a capital front load to capital expense, which just makes it easy for you to scale up and down uh, as needed from that perspective and not be dealing with a massive upfront capital expense that could be an inhibitor. Fully managed is the other aspect. I, I would assume that we, we know that, but, but just to reiterate that, fully managed by a security operations center in the United States uh, that basically all U American operators, all US operators uh, and security experts on call basically to, to support the environment there. So with that said, thank you very much for, for, the, uh, for the time. Ray, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Steve. That was great, very useful. Unless of course you're in South Dakota where apparently you already have all these, these things covered. But uh, <laughs> moving on to Craig Sandman and symbol security. Um, floor is yours, Steve. Or, I'm sorry, Craig. Yeah, thank you, Brian. And great job, Steve. Um, yeah, you can 
um, you can move to the next slide here and I'll give a quick introduction of symbol security then we'll move into the content. Um, so symbol security is a uh, SaaS platform. We deliver security awareness training um, as is the theme for today. We do it in a managed fashion. I'll get into why that's important. Uh, we are targeting human risk. So a lot of cybersecurity targets um, risk from a data, physical, logical perspective. Uh, we're aiming right at the people and through education, awareness, and data points, we can help people become less risky, which is a huge part of the equation. Um, we feature in the platform um, some things other than training, uh, and I'll cover them briefly here, uh, but for the most part today, we'll, just, we'll be focused on training. Um, but we, we do also supply uh, alerting on email and domain threats. Um, email threats would be most logically those that uh, are email addresses that have been compromised, uh, credentials meaning email address information or password information has been stolen. Um, we deliver training in an engaging way. So human behavior uh, and short attention span specifically make a certain style of training effective and other trainings not effective. Um, we also train through authentic simulation. So um, best way to represent that is uh, we deliver as real life as possible the situations we can so that when your users and your employees and your team members are face to face with a cyber criminal in their inbox on a text chain, whatever, wherever it might be, they're game ready. Um, and then from a reporting perspective, um, the idea is to make things simple and easy. Um, a lot of technology, a lot of tools uh, can be great, but if it's not simple, people don't use it. Uh, and finally, we have a darknet surveillance product we call cyber threat surveillance, which helps uh, companies and individuals get a better read on uh, the dark net, the dark web and activity there because it can be the precursor of cyber attacks, um, but just has very, very little visibility for the average uh, users. So that's, what, that's who Symbol is and, and what we do. We can forward to the next slide. Um, Let's just take a, another step through um, the cybercrime landscape. Um, short story is it's huge. Um, trillions and trillions of dollars in damages. Obviously, we're here because this is a big problem. Um, to put it in context, it's larger than the entire uh, global illicit drug trade, which is fascinating. Um, but additionally, um, there's 800 plus regulations and statutes that require evidence of security awareness training. This poses another set of risks. It's not just crime, it's also penalties and violations. Uh, and those have added to billions and billions of dollars as well. So I think people think of security awareness training as stopping cyber attacks. There's also this massive risk out there in terms of uh, failing to be compliant with any of those 800 regulations and statutes that any organization may have to be uh, continually in compliance with. So a lot of risks out there. Um, this, is, this is a very, very big problem for organizations. Next slide. Okay, so how can you protect your company and stay compliant? This formula is pretty simple. Um, the difficult part is doing it and sticking to it. So the formula is uh, on the human risk side of things, educate your employees and we test and we continue to monitor on certain vulnerabilities. Those vulnerabilities uh, are not gonna be like network vulnerabilities and, and things like that. So I think Steve did a great job uh, and the Xtel team as well, covering some of the more um, physical and data centric side of, um, of cyber attacks. We're talking about people vulnerabilities. So we repeat that cycle and through the visibility, through um, the regularity, we begin to recondition people and we tune down their vulnerabilities. We can't close them up entirely, but um, through awareness and education, uh, we really put a layer over that vulnerabilities and that layer's expertise and, and knowledge. Next slide. Okay, from a people training perspective, part of the challenge with educating and with, um, with taking employees, students, faculty to the next level of awareness is the specificity and the effectiveness of what you teach. And it's interesting, we talk about K-12 districts, that's what they do. They teach and they educate, right? So from 
an educational perspective, you know that you have to be specific and you have to have a method to teaching or else it doesn't work. And so what we've seen in cybersecurity awareness training and just the general messaging is it's too generic. The urgency's there, right? So the media and, uh, and other companies will, will push the urgency through fantastic statistics like I just did uh, and other scenarios to highlight how bad the situation is, but how do you stop it? Um, and if we look at the, this instance here, the example of um, phishing emails, phishing is a, is a big problem. Um, it's the, generally the number one entry point for cyber criminals is through email and through phishing attacks. And the answer to educating, the messaging there has been always kind of like, be careful, be cautious, stop clicking on phishing emails like this image says. But we need to get a level deeper and more methodical. And that's what we do as a training organization. We take people through a very specific set of education that isn't just telling them what's wrong. It's educating them on how to take the right steps. Um, so good visual here, really funny Saturday Night Live skit, if you didn't remember it from back in the day. Um, but that's, that's how we educate. And the places we educate on are recognizing phishing emails. Uh, there's some process oriented stuff too that can get you in trouble from a cyber crime perspective, like validating requests. Um, validating requests means, you know, not just taking an action because you're asked to, uh, through one medium like an email or a text, but following up with a phone call or walking down the, uh, the hallway and introducing yourself to someone and saying, hey, did you just ask me to do X, Y, Z? Um, so validating requests. Um, we talk a lot about wire transfers, but more generally moving money. So cybercrime is typically about money. Um, not always, but typically about money. And so having a process in place to validate any movement of money becomes super important uh, in this education process. Sensitive info with FERPA and schools is a very big deal. Um, protecting that sensitive info and understanding when you can and cannot disclose it or in what exchanges uh, you should and should not be disclosing it as well as validating the disclosure of sensitive info is also a very big part of our education. Um, Wi-Fi is an entire space of education as well. Uh, how it comes in for most people is around the use of Wi-Fi networks and also guest networks. So um, K-12 campuses uh, and then you know, employees, administrators that are traveling, Wi-Fi access becomes something that you deal with on a regular basis. How can you do it safely? And finally, management of passwords. Uh, doesn't have to be password managers, but that is by far the easiest and safest way to manage your world of credentials um, in order to access sites. Um, single sign-on plays a part in that as well. But educating um, users, employees, and staff how to properly um, respond to situations and then uh, stay within the boundaries on these topics is part of the curriculum that we put together for organizations. Next slide. Um, digging a little further in, as I mentioned, um, not clicking on phishing emails is, in, in, is a major focus of security awareness training. But in order to do that, you have to understand what a fish looks like and what it doesn't look like. And this gets us from, hey, be careful or be cautious to, okay, what do I need to look for? And generally speaking in emails, uh, the sender name and the links within the emails are going to be the places that you can either save yourself from getting in trouble or validate that something is real, um, legitimate or potentially malicious. And in this example here, you can see that um, the sender name, which is Netflix team, um, is, is a place that we're drilling down in in this example. And many people don't know that they can safely click there on a sender name to reveal more information. Um, when that's done, you can see the destination that the email is coming from. Now, if an email address has been compromised and it's being uh, operated by a, a bad actor, then of course the, that sender name is going to look legitimate, right? But in many cases, what our phishing emails uh, are typically um, manipulated domain names or 
um, just rogue domain names or general domain names that are operated by threat actors. And so being able to determine the legitimacy of a sender by the domain name and the sender name becomes an important part of the interrogation process. So we teach that right from the beginning in ways that everybody can understand. In this case here, uh, it's a little small to see, but in step number three, when you expand the Netflix team sender name, you can clearly see that this email is not coming from Netflix and that's an immediate knockout, right? So you're, you're not gonna proceed any further. Um, and with that methodology, you know, we, we educate people um, and we take them from a level that they're at in terms of cybercrime and fish recognition up to the next level. And with that comes a calculated reduction in risk. Next slide. And some further takeaways on phishing. Um, again, this is where we drill down in the education as well. Uh, we talked about validating the name and the sender name. Uh, manipulations in, in URL and subdomain are important as well. I'm not gonna dig into that here, but the graphic just below that was subdomain.domain.com. Um, the area of subdomain, uh, in many cases, you can insert a friendly name like Amazon or Walmart or something like that. Um, and people will believe that that's the owner of the URL. Not true. Um, it could be walmart.resetmypassword.com where reset my password is the actual domain name. Those are the types of domain names that cyber criminals love to buy. Um, so um, understanding those and what uh, is legitimate and not legitimate is an important part of our training. Finally, hovering over links. Everybody knows um, or should know if you hover over a link, you can see exactly where you're being taken to. And if you can't, if it's a shortened link or uh, it's something that you just can't understand, you probably don't want to engage. Um, and from there, you can take a secondary step of, let's just say it's your Amazon account. You can log in directly to Amazon and see if there's some kind of alert for you um, rather than clicking there from the email. Last step, which is as critical as any step, is assessing the situation for anything weird. If you're getting a request that has a heightened level of urgency or a situation that doesn't have what you would consider to be the right timing, um, those are your opportunities to validate um, through another me means like making a phone call, walking down the hallway to speak to someone, et cetera. Um, so those are the phishing takeaways. Next slide. And finally, um, in the same uh, category as just better understanding the phishing email and the, and the phishing attacks is understanding common scams and how they can happen. So we touched on wire transfer and ACH scams. I won't spend any time there, but a lot of times those scenarios um, become repeatable or similar when we look at it, the industry. So, you know, for teachers and educators, administrators, uh, there's teacher conferences, there's, um, you know, things that happen that will pull leadership away from a building. Um, and if cyber criminals know about that, that becomes a space that they can attack. So if the leaders are in a meeting um, or in a conference, you may get an email sent to an administrator uh, or, you know, a, um, an, a secretary, assistant, whomever that's on site that says, hey, it's me, you know, insert leader name. Um, I need you to do something really quickly for me. Can you go out and get 100 gift cards? Can you wire money to this account for um, you know, a situation we need to do really quickly? I can't take care of it because I'm tied up in meetings, but please do it for me. Um, so those scenarios are ones that you wanna be uh, cognizant of. Um, phony invoices, we simulate these in phishing all the time. Uh, these are great practice for your staff. If they get a phony invoice, uh, or a fraudulent invoice, can they recognize it, right? Do they take the time to go through the process to understand is this an actual invoice or not? Um, and in those cases, it looks like your vendor, uh, it's not hard to find out who your vendors are, but the amounts are different or the timing of the invoice is different. Um, in some cases, they'll, uh, these scams will request sensitive information. Um, and in other cases, they'll try to to get at information about things like donors or members and with schools, you know, there's a lot of outside um, activity and cooperation and events with parents or companies. Um, and in those cases, there's money ex being exchanged. A lot of schools are doing fundraising activities. Some of those fundraisers and donors are very important people that might be giving um, uh, very desirable information, bank information, et cetera, uh, back and forth with schools. So those are some common scams we see. 
Um, and through the trainings, people become more accustomed uh, to va validating and verifying information to the point where they can pick up on scams better than uh, uh, before the education had began. So that's a lot of what we see. Um, and you know, all the other thing I would leave you with um, with a great company like Axtel is, you know, when you have someone that's sitting on top of the program running it for you, uh, it takes a lot of the accountability of program execution off the plates of organizations that often have too much on their plate to begin with. Um, and so in working with Extel, we know they do a great job there uh, and we're there to, to support them as well. Um, and when the programs are run effectively, they work. What can happen is they're not managed by companies like Extel and others uh, is it becomes another piece of software for a company or school district to manage. And there's just in many cases too much going on uh, for that to be done effectively. And so um, again, you know, great job Extel putting this package together. Um, it's a huge, huge uh, win for school districts to be able to up their level of education uh, and reduce their risk. All right, thanks Craig, that was great. I think I read recently 80% of all cyber attacks are self-inflicted, meaning a user opens a phishing email or does something that you just uh, delineated. So stands a reason that some resources should, put, should be put behind training your staff. Um, so good stuff, Craig. So any questions, put, please put those in the chat window. I do have a few that have been queued up already that our attendees have given us. Um, let's see, Craig, this one looks like it's probably for you. Um, who typically gets trained in K through 12 cyber programs? Faculty yeah. administration or who would, who would be? Yeah, yeah. great question. Um, you know, the K-12 entities are heavily in population in many ways weighted towards students. Um, the bulk of the requirements or the only, really the only requirements around training are at the faculty and education level. So uh, those groups have to be trained and that's where the emphasis should always be uh, in a programmatic standpoint. And, you know, by, um, I guess by virtue of that too, it implies that you're not giving unnecessary or undue access to systems and things like that to students. Um, but the educators, um, the staff, the faculty, the administrators, these are the ones that should be a part of your training program. It doesn't mean that you can't also pass on the educational lessons to students because A, it's a great topic um, from a curriculum standpoint for K through 12 to build out. And I know those are being built out today um, really as, um, as part of a cybersecurity educational track. Um, and part of that includes safety. Um, so that's the place for, from the student population, um, where the requirement comes in and where the big return is, is at the faculty and administration level. Gotcha. All right, great. Uh, Steve, I believe this is for you. Can I just protect my users or do I need you to protect my users, servers, perk assets, et cetera? Yeah, you know, um, the, the protecting of the users is obviously a critical step into, uh, into protecting the, uh, the identities and uh, the operators, but, but really the bad actors are leveraging any, you know, any unlocked door or port or window, uh, what have you, um, and, and you really need to be defending the different methods of accessing the environment through the internet, uh, through the users themselves. Uh, so, that, that's really where that XDR, uh, you know, concept comes in uh, is, is defending the entire attack surface uh, because they will, they will use different methods to get to you uh, and it's not just down to the user level. So, so you really have to look at the, the risk state from an entirety and be able to, to, to uh, detect and respond across the attack surface. So not just the users. That's where that MXDR uh, piece comes in. Gotcha. Hey, guys, real quick, if you have questions, you should put them in the Q&A section, not necessarily the chat section. That's, that's my fault. I misunderstood. So if you have a question that you put in the chat section, just copy it and paste it in the Q&A section. We'll, we'll get to it uh, immediately. 
Um, do you have a few questions that they get through though? How often should passwords be changed? And if, if they aren't using the password manager, I assume that would go to either Craig or Steve, really. Yeah, I'll, I can jump in on that. Um, um, 180 days is a good number. Um, you might see less, you might see more. Um, but the real, the real key is that your passwords are unique. Um, that means they're not reused. So um, throw away the dog slash cat name um, and don't reuse those on multiple sites. You want a unique password for every site. That way, if one gets stolen or compromised, um, now they're not into every single one of your systems uh, or applications. And the second is, um, is really just making sure that um, you've got complexity of that password as well. Um, and this is where going back to password managers, they, they become important because having unique and complex passwords makes them very, very difficult to remember. Um, you're beyond the sticky notes at that point. Um, you don't want these things in a Excel or Word file that can be um, easily stolen uh, or misplaced. Um, you know, the, the, the password manager itself is the single best way to manage that. And you can actually set triggers on that to remind you to reset your password, um, you know, every, you know, once in 180 or once a year, whatever the case might be. Um, so that's my view on that, Steve. I don't know if you have anything to add there. As a security guy, you know, 90 to 180 days, you know, that, that, that's one of the things that really bugs people, though. You know, when you see it, it's like, oh, man, I just changed my password. Now I got to I got to switch my dogs or my kids and my password now and go through and update that. So it, it can be perceived as kind of a hassle to have to update passwords. But by by all means, this is probably one of the easiest attack vectors. So in our security yeah. operations center, we're watching these failed logins and these brute force attacks. And by far, that's the most common initial type of exploit that, that the bad actors will 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 pursue is basically trying to break in and 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 do so th by guessing passwords or brute forcing. Um, to Craig's point, password managers make this so much easier than it used to be. And my wife, she still writes down passwords and I'm like, honey, you got to get a password manager. She's like, no, she's sitting there writing passwords down in a little book. And I'm like, honey, if somebody breaks in and steals your password book, we're, we're hosed. You know, our, our financial, you know, empire will collapse. It can't get her to move to password management, but you know, it, it, it is what it is. Uh, you know, a password managers like RoboForm and LastPass, these are free technologies that really make it easy. They'll generate a hard password for you. And then as Craig mentioned, they can remind you to update your passwords as well within that suite. But then you don't have to remember the passwords. You're not writing them down in an insecure manner. Um, and, and that just really is one of, the, one of the key things I think that everyone should embrace other than multi-factor authentication, which I think is critically important as well, is that password changing periodically. Uh, and the use of a password manager, freeware out there, secure way to do it, makes it a lot easier than trying to guess your password or write them down. So storing all your passwords in a spreadsheet named password would be frowned upon, it sounds like. Ill-advised, Ill yes, sir. Okay. Here's a related question that just came through. Um, when you get notifications on Google Chrome that your password is part of Security Leak, what exactly does that mean? That means that somewhere uh, you're, you're basically, someone broke into an account of that you may have online, you know, Uber, Amazon, et cetera, uh, Gmail. Um, somewhere in, in cyberspace in one of the accounts that you had out there, somebody got to that attack and that could be, or got to that password. And, th and that could be that, you know, Uber was breached and they got the passwords out of Uber or something to that effect. Um, those are immediate action required kind of scenarios. What, one of the things that I, I saw was, was basically a, a friend of mine actually had his Gmail breached uh, and as a result sent a bunch of emails to everyone in his, in his Gmail that said, hey, look, I'm, I'm in Costa Rica and I can't get home. Please wire me a hundred bucks or whatever. Um, but the, if you get a notification like that, that your password has been breached, then you should go through pretty much all of your systems and, and update your passwords if there's not some sort of a, a required updating of passwords or changing of passwords. Got it. Makes sense. Ray, I think this question is probably for you. It's definitely for you. Is, is Xtel's DDoS mitigation proactive or is it reactive? 
Hey, thanks, Brian. Our um, DDoS protection service directly monitors the, your network uh, actively. So we're actively monitoring where it's a, uh, a proactive approach. So we have our um, DDoS protection service running all the time on your internet connection prior to the traffic hitting your firewall. So if we see any anomalous traffic or flood of information hitting your network um, or brute force, uh, brute force attack or any of the other denial of service attacks, we actively monitor, we detect, and then we destroy those potential DDoS um, attacks um, to mitigate them before they're hitting your network. So it's, it's constantly, it's always on. Um, and again, if you have any questions between the Q&A, I have looks like at least one more here. How effective is uh, Excel Cyber Incident Response Process Plan and when was it last tested? Actually, how effective is our Cyber Incident Response Plan? So I, I guess the question is how often should they be reevaluating, they being the schools, um, their Cyber Incident Response Process Plan and, and when it was last tested? How, how often should that evaluation take place? Every six months at, at minimum. I mean, quarterly for best practices, but every six months is more re reasonable from that perspective would be my input there. Okay. Perfect. Um, well, I think that is all we have as far as questions. Um, unless anyone has any last minute questions, I'll check the queue again. And no, nothing there. Well, I guess we'll just wrap things up. Um, Craig, Steve, Ray, thanks a lot for uh, being on the webinar today. A lot of great information. And thank you all to all the attendees. If you have any questions or like some follow-up on this, talk to your Excel account manager or you can simply email sales at excel.net if you don't have an account manager. And there's our phone number right there, 800-438-9835. Um, so it was a pleasure and I hope everyone has a great day. Great. Thanks, Brian. Take care. Thanks, easy. guys. Thank you. Thank you.